At Option Genius, we believe that you deserve freedom, financial freedom, so that you have no more worries and more than enough money. Time freedom, so that you could do what you want, when you want to do it. And choice freedom, to live your life on your terms. But the system and Wall Street are rigged against us little guys. So how do we fight back? Well, my friend, that's what this podcast is all about. My name is Alan Sama, and this is the Option Genius Podcast. All right, everybody. Welcome, Genius Nation. I'm today here with Mr. Virgil Hughes, who is a full-time trader. And he is actually, I wanted him to get on the podcast to share his experience, to share his stories, how he got started, what he does, so that he can explain to you how he trades for a living. But I also wanted, you know, and what really spoke to me about Virgil is that he mentioned that he uses his time away from trading to actually give back to other people and the world. And I wanted him to come on and share that message as well and to share with us what he's doing and how he's actually making the world a better place. So Virgil, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks, Alan. And thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be talking with you and sharing your story as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I always love talking to traders and, you know, the students that we come through our system and we have, you know, we've been doing this for a while now. So we have a lot of people that, you know, reach out to us and and share their success stories. And I think that really, for me, that has actually given me more of a passion of, you know, giving back and helping out and sharing their stories as well. So it's not just about me talking about myself, but it's actually, you know, other people are doing well and I want to, I want to share their stories as well. So Good. that's why we're here. And so Virgil, tell us, how'd you, how'd you get started in trading? Well, it's a little bit of an odd story. I think I've always been engaged or interested in the financial markets, but I spent a career as a CEO doing turnarounds and that was more than full time. And at one point I was diagnosed with cancer and wow. had to step back and try to get back into the workforce and had a relapse. And oh my! eventually I just kind of said, I, I got to figure out something else. And so I started doing some trading in the futures market and then learned about options. And so I sort of traded half-heartedly for a number of years while I did some consulting, but in the last few years have been doing it full time. Okay. So, I mean, how, how are you doing health wise now? Oh, it's long gone. That's wonderful. Uh, it can't, fortunately, cancer is a distant memory now. That's great. I mean, I can, I can imagine, you know, doing turnarounds, that sounds very stressful. I mean, I don't think. Yeah, it's extremely stressful. You, you have a lot of people that don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of like the Richard, um, what was his, Richard Dreyfus guy? In Pretty Woman? Was that him? Uh, no, he was uh, not quite. I can't think of a good cultural okay. icon to, <laughs> to, but, you know, companies that got broken because somebody screwed up, I would come in and fix them. And that would probably mean letting a lot of people go. Well, people get comfortable doing what they're doing and even if it's wrong. And so yeah. okay. I would have to help them see the light or help them see the door. <laughs> awesome. All right. So what are you trading now? What are your specialties? Well, mostly just equities and options and I've uh, and combinations of equities and options. And I've uh, over the last year been, been introduced to your crude oil trading process. And so mm -hmm. I've done that as well, but uh, mostly just combinations of equities and options. Okay. And how much time are you spending doing that right now? Well, over the last six or eight months, it's probably been, oh, half time. Over the last four weeks, as crude has collapsed, it has <laughs> been more than full time. Just but, watching the markets, right? Yeah, typically I can, I can spend some time checking on the markets and the rest of the time doing what I do. Right. Okay. And so how long did it take you to make, make that transition from dabbling in the market, learning about it to going and saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this for a living or yeah. full time. I, I don't think it's a matter of time. It's a matter of when you decide to do it, 
And what happened was I was running a, a chain of hospitals and felt called, I, I just left, and felt called to do the, the nonprofit full time. And that meant that I needed to have some source of income. And so, so I just took the knowledge that I, that I gathered and just started doing it. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think some people maybe their minds work differently, but for mine, it was, for me, it was just a case of, okay, now time to, time to get serious about this and do it. So, I mean, cause a lot of people, they, they reach out and they, they say that, you know, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm really hesitant or I'm really scared because, you know, I don't know what I'm going to fall back on. But I think it sounds like you found your, your why, right? You found your purpose. Like, Hey, I, yeah. I'm going to yeah. do this thing yeah. and nothing's going to stop me. And for me to get this, I have to succeed at this other thing over here, which is That's crazy. exactly right, Alan. Yeah, you put it very well. I, I don't think I could, I can elaborate on that. I found my purpose. And so this, I'm going to get there. That's awesome. It's awesome. Because a lot of times people, they don't know, you know, and that's one of the things that we've, we repeatedly, we told people like, you know, if you want to get good at trading where, you know, it has to be done. Like if you make it a must, and this is Tony Robbins talking, but if you make something a must, then it's going to happen. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I think that if you have your why, if you have your reason behind what you're doing, because when it comes to trading, you know, at the end of the day, how do you know if you're a successful trader? Well, you have more money in the account. And in the beginning, for people who don't have money, that sounds like, oh, that's going to be awesome. I'm going to have more money. I'm going to get to go out. I'm going to spend money. I'm going to buy stuff. But then you get to a certain point where that's not enough anymore. And I see a lot of traders in the beginning, they do do really well and their accounts grow. But then they get to that point where money is no longer the motivator and they lose focus. They lose yeah. interest. Yeah. And so then they, they have a relapse and they, yeah. and they lose all that money. And then they start back over again and they grow. But you know, so there was this one, one exercise that I read about in a book for people who, who don't know their why. Basically, it was to sit down with somebody like we're sitting here, you know, just sit across from somebody that you know, or that has your best interest in heart and just ask you a question like, hey, why are you doing this? You know, why do you want to get into trading? And then, you know, whatever answer you come up with, I want to make more money. Okay. Why do you want to make more money? Well, because I got to pay my bills. Okay, why do you need to pay your bills? And then they just keep rephrasing what you're saying and then just asking deeper, 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 why, why, why? Yeah. And it's a simple process, but if you do it right and you still go deep enough, you'll find something about yourself that totally blows your mind. Like when I did it the first time, I was like, oh my God, I never knew that I felt that way inside, you know? Yeah. And I think for you, it was, it was a little bit easier because <laughs> you found out right away. You're like, hey, I'm going to go do this nonprofit thing and nothing's going to stop me. But th yeah, that's exactly right. It, for me, trading is simply a means to an end. It's, and the, the end is outside of myself. It's not so that I can, you know, put more money in the account. It's not so that I can, you know, build a bigger house or, or something like that. It's so that so that I can get over to Africa more often or that I can bring on people who can get over to Africa more often, that sort of thing. Okay. So I do want to talk about that. But before we get into that, can you give our listeners any kind of advice or any tips or tidbits that you've picked up over these years to help them on their journey as how they can, how they can get to where you are? Uh, with trading or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with okay. trading. Uh, or, wow. I mean, anything in life generally, but yeah. mostly, you know, because most of our guys, you know, they want to know, okay, how do I get to where Virgil is, you know? Wow. Um, well, the thing that comes to mind right now is, uh, first of all, every trader is different and every market is different. And every mm -hmm. season of every market is different. And so you have to find your own style. You have to find what works for you. Maybe it's futures. Maybe it's an indicator that you know how to trade really well. Um, you know, John Carter uses the squeeze. Somebody else uses this. You know, somebody else uses Bollinger Bands. And the best advice that I can give is be in the game and keep accurate uh, records of what, what you do and what works and what doesn't. And eventually something's going to click and you're going to say, look, you know what? I can do this. 
and this works for me. And maybe it's Forex or maybe it's futures or maybe it's, you know, short options. Maybe it's long options. Maybe it's trading MACD. Who knows? Something at some point is going to click and then it's stepping out of the boat. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally stepping out off the cliff and just doing it. And uh, as you well know, Alan, when you, when you uh, uh, take a position with a short put, you know that there's a possibility that that thing is going to keep going down and mm-hmm. you just have to get in there and do it. And, and I think for me, I spent years buying different training programs and this person's advice and that person's advice and subscribing to different services, including yours. And at some point, you just have to say, this is what I know. I, I know how this works and I'm going to take responsibility for it. Mm-hmm. As, as a friend of mine wrote, you know, based on that, that movie, uh, that Tom Hanks movie, he wrote to me the other day, he says, there's no crying in trading. And that's right. You just have to, you got to man up and just. <laughs> there, there's a lot of crying in trading. <laughs> yeah. We might not there, admit it, but there, there is a there lot is of crying in trading, but, but we can't, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make anything go away. Yeah, it doesn't make it easier. Got to man up and take it. Right. So, okay. So, I mean, you, so it took you years and you went, you did all these different things. So what did you find in the end that works for you? What works for me, and I, I don't want to give specific trade type details because no, I, don't, I mean, yeah, just general, just yeah, try I don't to, somebody to take my advice and, and say, oh, it's works for Virgil. I'm going to go do this. <laughs> but, but what works for me is a common, yeah, financial disclaimer here, you know, <laughs> trade yeah, at your own yeah. risk. Yeah. What works for me best is a combination of selling short options around long positions and then with a smattering of other more exotic kinds of things but you got to keep your position size small you know short strangles and bct trades i have not really gotten into butterflies and back ratio spreads and stuff like that Um, the very exotic strategy yeah i i i know that people do them well i Mm -hmm. i explored at one point kind of the you know, you build a you you build a, a sort of a net with with several different calendar spreads and stuff like that, and and it looks it looks intriguing as all get out uh, on the uh, you know the graphic chart on Thinkorswim. Right. You know, one strong move and that's blown out of the water, and you just got to learn risk management and and how to how to adjust. And you know what. The trades that require a lot of adjusting mm-hmm. really aren't good trades. Um, and, and people will tell you that they make a living doing it fully for them. You know, I'm glad for them. I got work to do during the day. And then I'm in Africa four times a year. I need simple stuff that I can put on and actually leave for a, a few days. Because if I'm without Internet, I, I can't have my account be blown up. And I wish I'd taken that advice last week. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I'm hearing is that the bulk of your positions are in socks, in equities, and then you're selling puts against those? Uh, no, right? it, would be, it would be in equities or very deep in the money call okay. out, and then selling, selling individual options or spreads around that position. Okay. Yeah, we actually have something that I'm working on right now. It's called passive trading, the passive trading formula. And a lot of that is the bulk of it, you know, really, how do you set up trades? How do you set up your portfolio in a way that it only takes a few hours to manage it per month, you know, where where you can still earn the money, but it's just there regularly growing, growing, growing. So that's cool. And for those of you, you mentioned BCT. For those of you who don't know, BCT is the blank check trade, which is our oil course. You can find more information about that on optiongenius.com. But okay, so Virgil, you've mentioned Africa a couple of times. What's what's that all about? Well, I went to, you you know, I spent this time doing, you know, doing my work as a turnaround guy. And that's just hard work. I always felt that there ought to be something else. And then when I, when I uh, got diagnosed with cancer, 
it sort of, something sort of clicked and I just said, I gotta, I gotta think outside the box. Went to Africa on a church mission trip in 2012 mm-hmm. and had always heard about the concept of micro lending, but ended up doing a, a bit of research on that before I went and was able to see some great examples of how a small loan helping somebody start a small business can make a huge difference in a person's life in an undeveloped country or, a, or a, an underdeveloped country. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for, this is like us, micro microfinance you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. For us, you know, what, what would be pocket change almost for an American can help can help somebody in a in an under resourced country set up a business and can make all the difference. Yes. So, so I ended up chartering a, a nonprofit in 2014 after after a couple of trips to Africa, and then in 2016 I left the uh, hospitals that I was running and felt called to just do that full time, and so that's what I've been doing. Okay. So we. We have a nonprofit. We're federally tax ID'd, so we're a registered charity, and we have operations now in. Uh, we're in four sites in Kenya. We're starting in the Ivory Coast. We're starting in Ethiopia, and depending on some negotiations, maybe starting soon in Haiti, and have been invited into even more countries than I've just named. So there's a huge need there, and it makes a huge difference. So you're a U.S.-based nonprofit that is yeah. Yeah. lending money directly, or are you going through a local intermediary? Uh, well, what we do is you have to follow the banking laws of, of the countries that you're in, and each one is different. And so normally what we're doing is we're working through an intermediary in that country. Okay. Uh, that's a little bit uh, that's a that's an issue in and of itself because you got to find a trustworthy intermediary right uh, that's you know not going to make off with your money or charge you huge fees or something like that but normally what our first issue our first effort is to find a good partner in that country through whom we can you know that we can trust and through whom we can work and then uh, begin the process Okay. So it kind of sounds like, cause I, I mean, I've read Mamba Yunus's book, you know, he started, he started this in Bangladesh and it helped a lot of people. And I've, I've given money to with Kiva, kiva.org. And they do something similar to that, where you can pick the loans and you can give it to certain people. And for, for those of you who don't know, micro lending is really, really small loans, right? So they're like, what range do you give your loans in? Well, at this point, typically it's between U.S. about 125 to U.S. about a thousand. Okay. And, and I got a couple of pictures that'll that'll blow you away. But you know, I give you just one example. My very first trip, we spotted an opportunity among the. So from what I know, you know, there is this guy Muhammad Yunus in Bangladesh who was a professor and. He found that there were women in the main city there of Dhaka or in the little towns where they were trying to make, I think, baskets or something. But for every basket, they got paid very little for the actual amount that they were doing, amount of work they were doing, because there were so many middlemen. And so, you know, the idea was he said, you know, he found one lady and he said, you know, I'm just going to give you the money that you can go and uh, and skip all the middlemen. And it really changed her life. And one thing I'm going to ask you, Virgil, is how do you make sure that they give you the money back? Because in the Grameen Bank, which is Muhammad Yunus's organization, they have it where the women, they, make, they form a group. Yeah. And then each woman is responsible to make sure the other women pay back the loan. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, can you see my screen here? Yes. Yes, I can. It should show two stories. Yes. Um, and this is a very poignant story. The little guy you see on your left is a is a little kid that I met in a in an orphanage in the hill country of Kenya, and he uh, he was in the orphanage because uh, his mom disappeared. His his father had passed, and his mom was struggling to take care of to to provide. You know, there's not a lot of jobs in the mountains of Kenya, 
And, you know, she was praying with her pastor every week and stuff like that. And she got a job offer from a company in the Middle East. Wow. And they, and they told her, well, leave your son with some friends uh, or relatives. Come out, get established. When you're established and comfortable, you can send for your son. So she did. And they never saw her again. And uh, huh. they, they did get a couple of calls that were cut off within 30 seconds. And they came to the conclusion that she'd been kidnapped and trafficked by the, the people that. Oh, no. It was a false, it was a false offer and, and it was just a sham. And she's probably been trafficked into the sex trade. Um, and so the the uh, the other picture there, the woman with the sewing machine, similar story. Her husband left. She's got four boys. But because an American gave one hundred and twenty five dollars for a sewing machine, she has a small tailoring business and she's able to support her family. What's one hundred and twenty five dollars to you and me? That's ten dollars a month. Yeah, it's, nothing. Uh, it's like a dinner. Not even. <laughs> Not even a dinner, but it, this woman has built a business with it. And, and that's what happens. That's the promise or the opportunity from this kind of small lending. So you had asked a question, too, about how do we, how do we get the money back? Right. Yeah. Well, Muhammad Yunus was a genius in more ways than one. And we do exactly what he did. So we help set up what we call... The, the technical term in the industry is a savings and credit association. And I'm going to go here. Here's a good example. We help people set those up. It's actually kind of a sort of like a homegrown credit union where it's, you know, 15 to 30 people getting together to, to share their, you know, to save together, to be responsible together for each other. They learn to take out loans from the group and pay back the group. We use those groups as a springboard for training mm -hmm. where we teach them about good money management. We teach them about some business skills and perspectives. And Eunice actually didn't go that far. They were, he made the group responsible for the loan. We've taken it and we and some others have taken it a step further and we're actually providing training within the group. And what we've discovered is that the training is more of a life-changing thing than actually the, the small loans because only about 20% of the people will take out a loan, mm -hmm. but the training affects everybody and everybody learns from it. Okay. So the small group is not just loan holders, but just anybody who's interested in, in learning. Right. Exactly. So, like I said, we've taken the concept that Mohammed developed and tweaked it a little bit. And it's kind of, like I said, it's an easier term is a self-help group and kind of like a, a little credit union where it's owned by the people. They're saving together, but they also, you know, help each other. They, they can give loans to each other from the group without ever coming to us. It serves as a kind of a social insurance. You know, if somebody gets, gets sick breaks a bone, something like that, the, the group can step in and help them. So like I said earlier, our process is three parts. You know, one is helping them set up a self-help group. Two is providing some key training. And then three is the micro loan. So the loans are given from you guys or from amongst themselves? Like they pull both. the money and then they share it. Yeah, both. We encourage them to lend to each other. And then we also teach them business principles. We teach them how to, you know, develop a business plan. We teach them how to assess their products, their product in the market. We teach them how to assess the market itself. And then we insist that they put together a small business plan. And we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about a Wharton MBA here. We're <laughs> about some, some principles, some basic principles that have been you know, structured to be at this level. And the same thing, we're not looking at a 50-page business plan, but we are looking for people to think through their, their business and their process and then um, get the advice of their group. Then, then the group submits it to us and we will look at it. That's awesome. So it says here on the, on the slide, it says our goal of your organization, which is New Vines International, 
Your goal is one million adults in self-help groups hearing the gospel, praying together, receiving business skills and training, and providing for their families by 2028. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so now I got to ask you, how many how many have you gotten to? Well, <laughs> well, we're uh, that's a that's a fair question. What we found is that the best way to achieve that goal is not to just go out and try to set up small groups. What we're finding is that the best way to achieve that goal is to develop effective relationships with leaders in different countries. Mm -hmm. And and so we end up doing what what I call train the trainer. And so we we will train a group of leaders to go out and work within other churches and community ministries to, to essentially expand the network. So here is a group of trainers in the mountain country of Beaumet. They have graduated our program and uh, I'm sorry, the mountain country of Kenya. They graduated our program. Each of them will be responsible for reaching out to between six and eight different churches. Mm -hmm. And over on this side, this is about a dozen people from Western Kenya representing a whole group sort of pulled together by a, an NGO, which is kind of the, the equivalent of a nonprofit in a foreign country. And th this happens to be an orphanage slash medical clinic ministry but it serves as a center to pull together a group from about six or eight local denominations. And so these guys were training them to go back to their denominations. And each one would then be working with anywhere from six to 20 different churches. So our first goal is, is not to just go out and set up a bunch of groups. Our first goal is to find leaders and train trainers to go out to train other trainers. It's awesome. It's great. So it's building upon itself because once they're in yeah. the field, then they'll just keep passing on their information, their knowledge, and it'll just get right. bigger. That's right. awesome. So now from what you said earlier, you were saying that you, you know, you trade for a living. So you trade to pay your expenses and your bills. And then while you were working, you know, while you had your, your position at, with the hospital company, that's when you started this organization, right? right. This charity. This yeah. Yeah. And so you funded it yourself. And now you're at the pace where you're able to accept more because it seems like you're doing a lot of work. So it would be pretty hard for just one person to fund it. So you're seeking donations and you're opening it up to more people. Yeah. Is that correct? Because I, I've, you know, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was looking into starting a foundation myself and there are different ways to do it. You know, there's, there's different structures. Yeah. There's the charity and then there's the private foundation and then there's the family foundation and yeah. all different yeah. ways. Some of them can accept donations. Some of them cannot, but yours yeah. can. Yes. Ours is a 501c3, which is uh, classified by the IRS as a public charity. Okay. So we can accept donations uh, and do accept donations. They're tax, tax deductible. And so we have a level of accountability as well to the U.S. government. Actually, technically, it's to the attorney general of the state in which we're chartered. But, yeah, we, we accept donations. And that's, like I said, I, I pay my own bills, but then the, through the trading and then the, the donations that we get are, we call them partners. Our partners fund the travel and training that we do. Okay. Yeah, because a large part of most charities that I've seen is human resources, is marketing, yeah. um, administrative work. And, you know, I have a friend that um, she works for an NGO and I was talking to her and I was like, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about starting my own, my own foundation. You know, I don't even like, I, I'm just learning about it. So you already have experience in running one of these. Would you be interested in running mine? you know, because I don't know what to do with it. I'm just going to fund it. And she goes, yeah, I'll run it. And I'm like, okay, how much, you know, what kind of, you know, how much money do you make doing that? Like how much do I have to pay you and whatnot? And she's like, oh, she gave me a figure like mid six, like not mid six figures, but at least it was over six figures. Yeah. And I was like scratching my head. I'm like, you know, every dollar I give to you <laughs> doesn't go to the people that we're trying to help. Right. And she's like, yeah, but I'm worth it. And I deserve it because I'm doing a great job and this and that. And I was like, you know, 
there's a total disconnect right here yeah. between, yeah. you know, there's the employee mindset, then there's the employer mindset, and it's just totally different disconnect. Yeah. So what you're doing is basically you're not taking a salary. You're not taking any money out of this organization right. uh, because all your expenses are paid for by the trading, which is awesome, which is a great way to do it. Yeah, that that's correct. Yeah. So every every dollar that we get that we get in helps me either get over there and do training or goes into the loan fund with the exception of about 2%. I still have to, you know, I still have to have a website up. I still have to have, you know, an audit at the end of the year. I still have to from time to time, you know, buy a new computer and, <laughs> and stuff like that. So, so there's a, a fractional amount of what I would call administrative costs. Okay. But, um, you know, and things like visas, you know, I, you got to get a visa every time you go and that sort of thing. So there's some administrative costs, but you got to get your shots. <laughs> shots. Yeah. That's another one. So yeah. that's part that's of the, it's part of the, part of the job, right? So let me ask you now, from what I learned, most charities and organizations, they are required to stay on a charity. They have to give away at least 5% of their assets, right? On a yearly basis in order to maintain their 503C um, charter. And then with the rest of the money, they can actually invest it. So are you actually trading the money? No. That you, no. No, I would never... I spent, you know, all, I talked about being a turnaround guy. All of that was in the nonprofit world until my very last job was a running a for-profit hospital chain. I would never trade money that's given to a charity. There's actually some IRS rules about that in terms of what you can, the ways that you can invest that money. In. Right. And I think trading would be a clear violation of the IRS rules about that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Cool. What is your website so people can find out more information? Sure. It's uh, www.newvinesintl.org. So that's N-E-W-V-I-N-E-S-I-N-T-L dot O-R-G. Okay. And that's New Vines International. If you want to search it online, you'll be able to find them. Cool. Virgil, anything else? Do you have any other advice for our listeners? I wish I did have something that uh, was in, insightful and would catapult <laughs> people forward. But unfortunately, I don't, Alan. It's just plugging away, keeping at it, and eventually something clicks. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I guess the advice would be, just that. Keep at it. And and there are going to be hard times. And the financial markets can knock your socks off. But part of trading is to get back up and go at it again and keep your account size small <laughs> or your, 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 your risk small position size, your risk small. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's just something, you know, that I talk about a lot and it's like, you don't need a hundred different things to work. You need one to work, you know, you just need that one thing. Like you said earlier, that one thing that you find that you're good at and then you just, you just keep doing it and you keep doing it and you keep doing it instead of looking for 15 different ways to trade 15 different strategies to work out. You find one thing that works that fits your risk tolerance, that fits your temperament, you know, how much money you have in your account. Um, And even like how much you want to trade. If yeah. you want to sit in front of the screen all day, then yeah, you can day trade, but then you won't be able to do stuff like this. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you're more of a passive trader, more of an option seller, then you can still earn enough money to survive and to live a decent life, live a good life. And then with the rest of your time, you can go and, and help other people, which is, which is amazing. And it's something that, you know, um, I've always wanted to do, but unlike you, I never felt that, strong enough urge to say, all right, I'm ditching all this stuff and I'm, I'm just going to go do it. Um, so that, that is awesome. And I think you're, you're leading by example. So if, you know, if there's anybody out there that wants to do what Virgil is doing, I think I'm pretty sure that if you reach out to Virgil, he's also on Facebook. If you want to reach him to him there, I'm sure he'll help you and guide you and say, Hey, you know what, try this or go in this direction or whatnot. 
and it's been it's been a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Yeah, glad to. If anybody wants to reach out, I'm I'm here. Facebook, Virgil Greg Hughes. And I, I got to say, it's been a wonderful journey. This is where life is at, is getting beyond yourself and doing something good in the world. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's more than just leaving like a legacy, you know? Because I mean, like we yeah. talked about this earlier, like after you get to a certain point where it's like, okay, I've made enough money, now what? And yeah. now people ask me all the time, like, you know, Alan, why do you have Option Genius and why are you doing all this stuff? If you're so rich or you're doing so well trading, why don't you just go live on a beach in Hawaii or something? I was like, yeah, you could, but, you know, after a while you get bored and you yeah. actually, you want to help other people. You that, get back. It's, it still becomes kind of empty if you do that. Yeah. 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 There's only so many pina coladas you can drink. <laughs> 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 all right all right folks well we appreciate you tuning in like i said contact virgil if you have any questions and we'll see you on the next episode good alan thanks so much it's been an honor to be with you thank you virgil for having us take care <laughs> all stocks are not created equal we've analyzed thousands of optionable stocks to find the very best ones to trade options on lucky for you you can just download the list for free get it at Simon says options.com forward slash stocks. Again, that's Simon says options.com forward slash stocks.